each dimension corresponds to a specific user interest as specified, because each dimension is grounded in a uh, Twitter badge, right? So it's not arbitrary dimensions like in word to vec or in topic modeling or PCA. The dimensions are not sort of arbitrary in the sense that they're just based on some statistical uh, model of whatever the data contains, right? Each badge is, is actually forced to correspond to a specific user interest. That's the key difference between this approach and the other unsupervised dimension evaluation approaches that we talked about in class. Yeah? So I guess for every badge you have like an eigenvector kind of article which is mostly associated with that badge? Is it you have a vector of words. Yeah, which is associated with that tag for like, from training. That's but right. Once you have an article, you can encode it using of badges which correspond to these vectors of words. Yep, that's right. So those and that's how you do dimension. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so they're high, badges are higher level than words because you know there are much fewer badges than there are unique words. Oh, here we go. So, so if we represent this, so if we represent this using just the word cloud, so this is a visualization of number of frequency of words, individual words, you get something that looks like this. And it's hard to really generalize from this to other articles in order to figure out what users are interested in. If you represent this as a linear combination of badges and then visualize the most common words within that linear combination of badges, you can see looks like this. Turns out that you can learn train these badges. So it turns out that you know the meaning of the word badge, uh, meaning of the, the the words associated with the badge, can drift over time. Right? So consider politics, right? If you are you know a, a liberal, if someone identified liberal or conservative, the set of words that associate with those badges might be very different in November than they are you know last year, right? Because of the top, the 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 the, the temporal, the, the current events change, right? But the fact that you identify as a, let's say, a liberal or a conservative, that tends not to change over time, right? So we can actually learn a time-varying dictionary, or time-varying dimensionality reduction. Okay, so step one uh, so of this two-part sort of procedure is to learn a badge dictionary from the training set. So this is this is this from and the training set looks like this. So this is what the training data looks like. We have um, uh, this is a, each, each entry of the training set is a tweeted article. So Y can appear, um, can appear multiple times in the training set because it's the bag of words representation of a document which may be tweeted multiple times by multiple people. This is a vector of, so this is a vector of, of Twitter, of badges in, in all Twitter profiles. So for example, um, so this Y is a, why would, if this is the article, why would be a bag of words representation? You typically would want to normalize this so the, the, the counts uh, are about our sums of one. And then Z corresponds to the Twitter user that tweeted this article, and it's an indicator vector of which badges are active for this Twitter user. Yeah. So this is what the training data looks like. And so here's the training objective. We want to learn two models. Uh, the model has two, 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 two matrices of parameters, one B and one W. And the basic idea is that um, we want to reconstruct the words in this article using uh, some linear combination of badges. So W, uh, sorry, B is your badge dictionary. It's a matrix of words by badges. W is the encoding, is the encoding of um, is a matrix of encoding every article uh, by the badges. So it's badges by articles. And I'm abusing notation here a little bit because uh, I'm abusing notation here a little bit because you know, some articles may be tweeted more than once, and so you just have to account for that using indexing bookkeeping. So this is the same as the like, factor stuff. Yeah, except instead of just having random initialization factors in this training the best thing factors using using essentially unsupervised learning, we inf we have some way of inf constraining what each latent factor can be by using badges. So this is the objective function, right? It's just like latent factor modeling, except um, you know we're going to constrain what the latent factors can be using badges. Okay, 
called a diction is also known as a dictionary and known as a decoder. Not, again, not a convex optimization problem. Convex only if we optimize one of B or W, but not both. So we do alternating optimization, something that you've already seen in the homework. Uh, the, so as it stands, there's nothing about this that's different from lean factor models, right? Uh, there's a, we do L1 regularization to keep, these, to keep the dictionaries and the coding sparse. But otherwise, it's not that much different from this and lean factor models. The main thing that's different is how to initialize, right? That's the only thing, that, that's the main thing that's different between this and a sort of a, a, a standard lane factor model that, be, that you did on your homework. And so the way you initialize is you set, you initialize W, which is the encoding of badges to, uh, badges to articles using the average, right? So if you do random initialization, this just defaults to um, the type of lane factor models that, this more or less defaults to the type of lean factor models you guys did in your homework. Um, but of course, this is a non-convex optimization problem, sort of local, multiple local optima. And this is the, this is the choice of um, initialization that they use to get into a specific local optima that they want. Yeah. And, and, what, and this is the part that uses badness. Yeah? So can you explain again why do you I'm sorry? Why do you multiply B with W with simplification? So B is um, words by, so this is word, number of words. This is a, uh, let's see, it's a contradict column vector of number of words, like number of words in your vocabulary, right? This is number of words by number of badges, right? And so if I want to represent, if I want to reconstruct this article as a linear combination of badges, then W is a, is, um, a, is a specific uh, linear combination of badges for this article. And then we just simply multiply the entire matrix B by this vector W to get this vector. Why is it an extra article instead This is the number of articles in your training set, the number of unique articles in your training set. Oh, okay. Yeah. So WI looks at a specific column of W. So this is a this is a matrix of number of words by Badges. This is a vector. This is a matrix of number of badges by article. So W I is a is a column vector of number length number of badges. You can think of every badge as a length dimension in dimension in reduction uh, lingo. So if yeah. So this is not that different from you know like the Netflix problem that you guys did in your homework, where this is a user and this is the vector of all the ratings of all the movies that this user gave. But this is a vector of ratings of all the movies that a single user gave. This is the same objective function, uh, ignoring the differences in regularization. And the, and the main difference is um, here is that uh, this particular initialization using the badges of, of the Twitter users that tweeted these things is the main thing. So you know, if you look at this objective function, right? In normal dimension reduction, we don't have the z, right? We just have a y, and then we just solve this optimization problem again, ignoring the difference, the minor difference in the regularization. We just solve this objective function, just like the lane. This is just the lane factor model with the Netflix problem, but we don't have the z, so we just do random. We pick a, we guess a number of lane factors, and we randomly initialize it, and then we do gradient descent, right? Here we have a badge representation of users, right? If we, we, we tweet this article. And so, and so we initialize, not randomly, so we set the number of badges, first of all, we set the number of lane factor dimensions equal to the number of unique badges, and we initialize the articles by the average, by the, by the average of the, uh, the badges of the Twitter users that tweeted this article. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as lane factor ones from the homework. Right. Yeah. So a stupid question, but WI is so for every article how the user No, for every this is now this is now user independent. We're learning a representation of documents. We're learning a representation of news articles. So WI is the badge representation of an article. 
right? So if this there are if there are fifty thousand badges, I forget the exact number of badges they use in the experiments, but let's say there's fifty thousand badges that want to represent every article as a fifty thousand dimensional vector, as opposed to a million dimensional vector if there's a million words in your vocabulary. And the way we do this, construct this fifty thousand dimension, is we use the badges of the Twitter profiles of the people who tweeted this article. Rather than doing unsupervised dimensional reduction, such as words of vec or PCA, you know, or late factor models. So, you know, just like in sort of standard late factor models from the perspective of W, these are features and vice versa. And we're doing a one regularization because we want these uh, dictionaries and the encodings to be sparse. So we want every we want every document to be. Uh, you know, we want every document to be a, a, a linear combination with only a few badges, we, uh, and we want every badge to be associated with only a few words. That's why we need a one regularization, right? However, you know, a given document tweeted by a given by a certain user, you know, might be about you know music or festival or gig simultaneously because these are highly correlated badges, right? And Lasso again tends to focus on only one if these. If these badges are correlated, then Lasso tends to just focus on one of them and zeroes out the rest, which is not actually not what we want. We want all these badges to learn something interesting, not just one of them. Right? And so there's an extension in the paper which, uh, which they, in which they use something called Graph Guide Diffuse Lasso, and, the, and you know it's a fancy name, but the main sort of thing that uh, the main thing that's sort of different is that they want uh, badge, they want uh, badges. Uh, sorry. So, e, so we have a graph of related badges, and we want the we want the feature uh, activations of um, related badges of a given article to be similarly active. Yeah. Why not just not do lasso and regularization? Um, but then then you'll have like a non-zero matrix. It'll be huge. Like the number of non-zero entries will be huge. It will be the, basically the entire dictionary. Turns out that slows down optimization a lot. Like when you have like 10% sparsity, 1% sparsity, you can do sparse inner products, sparse arrays, and optimizing it is so much faster. So that's one reason. In fact, it may be the primary reason. So that's um, what you would want to do, like a light lasso and then like a stronger bridge regression or something like that. Because it sounds intuitively, I think it would seem like that that is the result. So one of the one of the goals of this project stated in the introduction of the paper was that they want the badges to be interpretable. Okay. So if you want to do that, you want to use last, you want to use that one organization. A side effect is that when you have when you have like one percent sparsity or something ten percent sparsity, each badge only activates like hundred words, yeah. right? That's the inner, the, you could do sparse inner products, right? Like just using link lists, yeah. and it's so much more efficient than having to enumerate over a million dimensional vectors. And so, you know, two badges are related by their co-occurrence rate of Twitter profiles. So, okay, suppose we've done the whole thing and we've trained a new, have trained this dictionary to be. And now a brand new article gets written and gets published on the internet and we want to encode it using this badge dictionary, right? So that, what that basically amounts to is we have a new document, J, and we want to learn the badge encoding of that document. Which is a vector of number of badges, which is a column vector with length equal to number of badges. And so then you just have to solve those optimization problems, and you're done. You just hold B fixed, and then. Uh, and so if you if you if you commit so right if you commit to a B, all the Ws become sort of independent of each other. The problem becomes uh, convex. And so if you regard committed to a B, and a brand new document comes along, this is a very easy optimization. So we learn a badge dictionary from the training set, and we use that badge to share to encode new articles. That's the basic idea. And so here are some columns of that B. So these are individual badges, right? So for two people with, who identify with music in their Twitter profile, this is sort of the type of word that appear in the, art, in the articles that 
Twitter users who identify with music tend to tweet. Uh, keep in mind, this is from September. This is from this is trained from a training center from September 2012. Um, so if you identify with some people, identify some people put Biden in their uh, in their um, Twitter profile, and so you identify with this. If you're from the UK and you identify with the Labour Party, this is the this is the article that you tend to tweet, and so on and so forth. One of the nice things about badges is that people badges the badges you identify with tend to stay static over time. But the types of articles you might tweet that might be relevant to that badge might drift over time, right? So in 2010, uh, Joe Biden was on the Colbert Report, uh, and so if you had the Biden badge and tweeted about Joe Biden, you tended to you know tweet articles that had this distribution. So the, the B matrix can drift over time, but the encoding of articles, so, so B can drift over time, but W can stay the same, right? And what this means is that if you, if you, if you personalize, uh, what this means is that if you personalize to users as a, as a, in, the, in the space of badges, then you don't have to relearn that model every, every, every month, let's say, when the distribution of, of words of articles corresponding to that batch change over time. We just have to, we just keep that part static. Yeah. So, I'm understanding, it seems like the second one, Biden, is a, the Biden word is associated with the Biden tag, right? Saying that in 2012, like, people at the Biden tag didn't tweet the article about Biden. Uh, Biden. Yeah, it's not as, uh, it's, yeah. So if you were, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you were a Biden supporter, uh, the articles you tweeted were predominantly about Romney and Obama. What happens when it's election, election season? Yeah. Maybe the tag was like Obama Biden or something like that. I'm sorry? Maybe the tag could have been Obama Biden or something. I don't know. Right, so the way they create tokenized the tags, you know, it was a heuristic. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's just one sort of visualization that they did in the paper where they limited the badges to progressive versus top conservatives on Twitter. Right. And so, uh, based on who, based on sort of who tends to, uh, based on the badge encoding of articles written by these people, right? These are sort of political columnists. You can sort of predict whether or not you can sort of measure whether or not they're more they they they, they project more on the progressive badge or project more on the TCOP badge. And so this, uh, with a couple. Minor exceptions looks like what you'd expect. They also did a user study where um, you know, they uh, ran a user study on some account took with 1,200 top users and they showed a random 20 articles from The Guardian and obtained ratings. So they asked, so it's phase one, they asked users to rate our, uh, 20 articles based on their interest in them. And then from that, they picked a random representation. Um, words, topic models, or badges, and then they used, uh, they represented a user, so this is how they personalized, they represented users as the average of the liked articles in one of these representations, right? And then they go to the next time period, and they recommend according to the preferences. And they repeated this process. And so this is just the result of the user study in terms of number of liked articles as, as part of this personalization setup. And they found that you know the number of liked articles you can find using badges outnumbered sort of standard bag orders or high level topic models, which is evidence that this type of representation might be something that's better in, in between sort of two coarse grain or two or two coarse grain or two fine grain. Okay, so just to recap, any uh, so the, the basic idea here is to use sparse dictionary learning, which is mathematically more or less the same as dimensional reduction weight factor models. You want to learn a new, new low-dimensional representation over articles, and then you want to find it. So this is you think of as the U, and you want to encode articles using that dictionary. So you can think of as the V in your uh, in your homework. Um, you struck, you constrain these, or, or you initialize these using the badge information on Twitter, rather than doing random initialization, and this leads to better representation of badge words or high-level topics. Any questions on this before we move on to the last application? Okay, 
the last application, probably the most uh, fun to look at, is learning visual style. Okay, so this is based on the paper uh, which appeared in ICCV last year. And so the basic idea is that based on the image of, um, of, a, of an item, let's say a piece of clothing, uh, we want to learn whether or not this piece of clothing is visually compatible with this piece of clothing in terms of style. Right? So the model predicts that these pants are compatible with these uh, sweaters and that these socks are incompatible with these uh, pants. Yeah. So these are just some examples of the model that the model predicts as compatible or incompatible. And if you're interested, you can uh, browse the project on this. So the training data comes from Amazon, or scraped from Amazon. So there's a ground set of elements, about a million elements. Uh, these are things like jewelry, coats, pants, belts. So every item comes with an image, uh, the, the image of the item on Amazon, and then a category. Right? You can also mine Amazon to get pairwise relationships, and the specific one that they focused on in this paper is whether or not two items were frequently bought together. That's something you see when you sort of browse the items on Amazon. You see a list of things, other things that are frequently purchased together with this item that you're looking at. So you can actually mine that pairwise relationship. And the interpretation is that two items, at least these types of items, um, are visual, quote unquote visually compatible in terms of style, style if they're frequently bought together. Okay. So here's the training goal. I'm ignoring regularization, so the actual training goal is a little bit more complicated than this. So there's all the model parameters of the model. These are embeddings of the image. So the goal of, the, the goal of this project is to learn an embedding of, over the images. So take an image, convert it to an embedding, like a represent, feature representation in some implicit feature space. Right? That's what phi does. And phi is parameterized by theta. And the x's are the raw images. The first summation sums over compatible pairs. So these are pairs that were labeled as frequently bought together. Um, and then the loss function says, I want to incur a high penalty if the embedding of the, um, if the, embedding of the images of these, of these pair of items are too far apart. The second summation sums over uh, incompatible pairs. So, so pairs that were not labeled as frequently purchased together from scraping from the, from the Amazon data set. And this loss function penalizes, it has a high penalty if the embedding of the two images uh, from these pairs are too close together. Right? So this is the objective function. And the loss functions, I won't go into detail, but they're what you expect, they're like square distance and other sorts of distance metrics. So they're differentiable. And uh, furthermore, the, the, in this particular project, the, you only train this over um, pairs in different categories. So like this, these pants are, are, are frequently purchased with this sweater, for example. Different categories. So that's the learning objective. We want to learn an embedding, a, a mapping from images to some implicit feature representation, such that within this feature representation, um, within this feature representation, uh, compatible pairs, frequently purchased together pairs are close together, and those that are not frequently purchased together are far apart. That's the, that's the objective. Okay. And so the question here basically is, well, what is the form of this model? Right? How, do we learn, how, well, how do we learn a mapping, primary or whatever, theta, from Im images, pixels, to some representation? And they used a convolutional neural network. So recall from the deep learning lecture, the this is one instance of a convolutional neural network. Where given sort of a three-channel image, RGB image, and through a series of convolutions, uh, uh, the original CNN was was trained by a supervised learning to predict multi-class object detection, like is there a cat in this image, so on and so forth. What they did is they took the same architecture, they removed the final output layer, and they just, they just treat this final hidden layer, the outputs of this hidden layer, as the embedding. Right? This is the late. This is the this is in this particular case, although they didn't use 4096. In this particular case, you would map an image to a 4096 dimensional vector. That's your embedding. So, uh, the way they trained it, uh, the way they applied convolutional neural networks in this uh, learning framework, is using a method which um, is called Siamese convolutional networks. Uh, so, basic idea is as follows: you have two you have two images. 
right? X1 and Xi and Xj. These are the pixels of two images. And these are the pixel images of two items. We run it through a CNN. We get some embedding, which is the final hidden layer of the convolutional neural net, right? So I call this phi i and phi j. And then we compare, you know, we compare the, we, we compute the loss between phi i and phi j. So in particular, if phi i and phi j come from the frequently purchased together group, then this loss is, this loss would, will, will encourage phi i and phi j to be close to each other, right? Which backprops a gradient all the way through the entire all the model parameters of the convolutional neural net. If phi i and phi j are from the not frequently purchased together uh, pairing, then the loss function will encourage phi i and phi j to be far apart from each other, which will induce a gradient that that props through the entire uh, neural network by a chain rule. The reason why it's called Siamese is that these, this convolutional neural net is the exact same model, right? It's just applied twice, right? Just like Siamese twice. Interesting name choice, but and if you're interested in the details, you can refer to this paper. But that's the basic idea. We have one convolutional neural network. It's used to compute the embedding of the uh, of a pair of pairs of images at a time, and then based on what the loss function tells you, you want this embedded to be either pushed closer together or further apart, and that induces a gradient that you can apply by a chain rule to backprop throughout the parameters of the of the model, and each. Train, each training pair induces a pair of gradients on the same CNN. So they're getting changes. The two ones are getting changed. The two, the two CNNs are getting changed the same way. That's what that problem again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, one, the one CNN is being changed. So okay, yeah, so there's yeah. one. Oh, yeah, just hot. Yeah. They're drawing that uh, every layer. Okay, so just to recap, this is the training goal. So we want to fit the model parameters of the embedding model such that for every pair of uh, items uh, that are sort of in the, in the labeled as frequently purchased together, we want the embedding of the images of those two items to be close together and this loss function penalizes if it's too far apart. So we can think of this as square distance. And in fact, in the paper, they, this is exactly square distance. And for pairs, uh, and for pairs that are uh, not labeled as frequently purchased together, we want their embeddings to be far, uh, to be um, far apart from each other. This loss function is actually uh, a slightly more complicated version of the negation of square distance. Right? And so this whole thing is differentiable. The, the theta is all the parameters of the embedding phi, which is a convolutional neural network that maps images to some uh, latent, uh, latent uh, representation. So you train the whole thing by gradient descent and chain. Now in practice, they don't use 4096, which is the orig what the original AlexNet did. They use something smaller, 128 or 256. It's a little bit lower dimensional. Um, you also uh, can't enumerate over all possible incompatible pairs, which are basically the, the set, the set, uh, set complement of all possible compatible pairs. So that dramatically outnumbers the number of compatible pairs. So they did some smart subsampling of the negative pairs, and you can check out the details in the, in the paper. And so here's a sort of a 2D sort of uh, projection of the embedding. Um, over here you have sort of um, casual shirts and hats, kids' clothes and kids' backpacks, jewelry, um, various pants, watches, shoes and pants that go together, supposedly by, according to the model, and so on and so forth. So items that are close together are considered items are, so items that belong to the same category are not part of this objective function. So they can be they're not constrained by this model. Of course, because they're because it's a convolutional neural network, items in the same category tend to have the same similar um, visual patterns, and so they tend to be in similar locations anyways. But items that belong to different categories that get put in, in the similar locations are learned that that's what's learned, that's what the embedding has learned that these two things pair together because they're frequently bought together. And this is based purely on the visual characteristics of the item. So one application of this is to suggest outfits, right? So uh, if this is your query, so let's say I want to buy this shirt, what else should I buy with this shirt? Well, we can predict this. This is what the model predicts. Uh, the details are in this paper. 
Uh, this is the query outfit. Let the model like this, and so on and so forth. So these are active predictions by the model, based only on visual characteristics of this image, of the item. How do they deal with the fact that, like, in the top one of the image, like the second picture, you also see his pants? And how do you know if it's a model? So you have for every item, you have its image and its category. Oh, so you are okay. okay. Yeah. And that's what you get from Amazon. You get, you get, let's say, a million items, and mostly clothes and jewelry and stuff like that, and, and, and clothing accessories like backpacks. You get um, the image, the canonical image, so the front facing or the canonical image, and then you get um, a category. So, so this this is a little bit sort of instrumented. Like we know that these are upper garments are like things like shirts, sweaters, jackets. You know, lower garments like pants, shorts. And shoes, sandals, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I mean, the naive thing to do for, for doing this is to you know, give it a query item, which is I, and we have its embedding, and we have its category. We just simply, for other categories, represent, for take category items in other categories, rep and, and recommend the item with the closest embedding. And that's what we trained on, right? That's what we should do. The problem is that uh, there is a small but very annoying amount of categorization noise in the labels. So for example, a small fraction, a very small fraction, but of uh, let's say pants are actually miscategorized as shoes in the, in the annotations. This happens. The problem with visual embeddings, of course, is these two things look very similar, right? So the CNN will map these to more or less the same parts of the space. So if some pants, if any, if, if, so basically, as in the work, uh, in, if any pair of pants was miscategorized as shoes, or any pair of jeans, let's say, was miscategorized as shoes, and your input query was a pair of was a pair of jeans, and you want to find the closest shoes, it'll always return this. Right? This is this is always going to be the closest in the embedding because it's basically visually almost identical. That's not good. The insight that they had in this paper was that miscategorization, of course, are rare. So in order to be robust to these miscategorizations, they started predicting the closest shoe. Let's find the closest cluster of shoes, like a dense cluster of shoes in the embedding space. Right? And so what they do is they first do a little bit of pre-processing where they cluster every category. So for shoes, they maybe cluster the shoes that mean like 20 or 30 or 40 <coughs> clusters using, let's say, k-means in the embedding space. Right? And then at query time, so let's say given an input query, and we know that the category of this input is pants, we, and we want to predict the recommended a shoe, a, a shoe category item, then we find the closest cluster center, a, a closest sort of center of mass cluster, the center of mass of a cluster under a category of shoes closest in the embedding space of the input query. And then we output a shoe item close to that cluster center, which with high likelihood intuitively will not be a miscategorized example. It's a little bit more complicated, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but you can check it. If you're interested, you can check the details in the paper. One can also compute coherence of an outfit, right? So you know, you could say, okay, here's this guy, what is he wearing? Uh, let's say it's these items. We could compute sort of the average distance of these items in the embedding space to figure out if these people are coordinated or least coordinated or most coordinated as measured by the average purchase, uh, by the aggregate purchase activity of, of Amazon users. Uh, we could also model uh, stylistic preferences over time, right? So you could say, well, what, what are items they tend to get sort of purchased or um, have? So this one, this particular project uses uh, uh, incorporates both uh, frequently purchased together and also ratings. 